Yeah. <laughs> You're up. Okay, we're at week eight of our course on Hebrews, and we're in Hebrews 5, uh, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 12. And just a reminder, we're still in the section that's talking about Jesus being greater than the high priest. Uh, today, we're going to take a little bit of an aside, and another one of the warnings in the book, I think this is the third or fourth warning that's been given. I think there's one left in chapter 12, uh, but I think there's five in the book. My memory could be gone. But at any rate, that's what's coming up now. Um, we're going to take some more look at these uh, warnings, and then next week we'll come back to talk about Melchizedek in much more detail, okay? So let's uh, begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we've gathered here today so that we can study your word and listen to your warning. Lord, always have us be thankful for the milk of your word, the foundation, but also keep us growing in that word so that we can be discerning and understanding what's right and wrong. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This is a section where we have, like the Apostle Paul and Peter, used this idea of milk and, and uh, you know, craving pure spiritual milk, talking about the Word of God. But here we're going to talk about it from a little bit different angle than Peter does, and that's that we shouldn't stay on milk. You know, little babies graduate into solids. And if you get stuck just in the milk of the word, that's okay in one sense, but you got to be growing your faith. You need to get the solid food so that you can live in this world and, and deal with the problems that come up. Now, just a reminder for us, since we missed last week, being it's called a pastor's conference, but just so that we remember that these people are Jewish descendants, descendants of Abraham, and they were struggling with, do we go back to the old ways? Or do we stay with the New Testament? Well, everything that he says today is going to tie into that, okay? So let's read verses 11 to 14 of Hebrews 5. And whoever reads, read nice and loud so it gets picked up here by the camera. We have much Cindy, to say. thank you. Cindy, okay, go ahead. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Thank you. Um, you you kind of got the drift of this already because of what I said, I'm sure of that. But this idea of, of um, we have much more to say about this is an interesting thing. You know, I... On Sundays, you get done with this sermon, okay, join me in prayer is what I usually do. Years ago, it was you say amen at the end, and then people knew it was time to stand up. Uh, Lutheran gymnastics, you know. Um, and, and then the votum used to be used there, but I move into a prayer and, and move forward. Uh, just a little bit of a shift there. Uh, but be that as it may, there are times I get done with a sermon, and I think these very words, I still got much more to say about this. You know, but we ran out of time today. And I'm always reminded that it's not a one Sunday deal for a pastor. It's you're building week after week after week. And not only on Sundays, but the Bible classes that are also there. So you may have picked up on this already. When I'm teaching a particular book of the Bible, I, that's on my mind all the time. And then I preach a sermon and it's on my mind from the Bible study and have you ever noticed how they, I connect things from Bible study into the sermon? There's a reason I do that. It's not helter-skelter. It's because I want you to, to understand the whole counsel of God. And I want you to build on things that we've already laid a foundation for. So this week, well, yesterday, I had the eighth graders together for confirmation on Sunday, which will be on the other campus. So I'll, I'll apologize now. The attendance here will probably be down a bit because of the whole Oslo family, the fevers. 
my son and fam his family are going to be out of town this weekend. There you go, 20 people just like that. But um, we won't be losing them to the totals, you know, because they're kind of out there. But um, I was telling the kids yesterday that their whole status is changing now from being just a baptized member to being a confirmed member of the congregation. And I, I was sitting with them, and, and I just said, you know, from now on, I'm going to treat you like an adult, not a child anymore, even though I know you're not fully matured yet. But I'm going to treat you like an adult when it comes to everything as a member of a congregation. And, and it was kind of like the light bulbs went on a little bit with the kids. It was kind of fun to see. And it became a very positive discussion with them about confirmation, Sunday schools, laying a foundation. That's all milk. And for the rest of their lives, we're going to be building on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and, and the Old Testament, New Testament, right? Prophets and apostles. And I said, that's really important. I'm bringing that up here because that's basically what he's talking about, using a different uh, figure of speech, a different picture, okay? The picture here is got a baby, and the baby drinks milk because it can't ingest and digest solid food yet. It takes a while for the body to keep growing to the point where they can eat solid foods, right? That's always one of the big things with, with new moms. Okay, are we up to solids yet? And you start with that rice junk, you know, and whatever. And then all of a sudden you get to do the Gerber little jars, you know. And our kids, they went from that to eating steak real quickly. They, <laughs> they always were very costly kids. Um, but anyhow, the point is, though, that's the way it is with Christian faith. And, and I talk to people about that all the time. you you got to keep going. It's not just, okay, I made it this far. We have to keep building up because the temptations keep coming at us. The trials keep coming at us. Uh, the things that make us angry keep coming at us. The things that, and fill in the blank, right? And that's what he says here, right? But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. We call that discernment. You have to make judgment calls on what you hear and see, even what you think sometimes, right? So we need to know the law of God, which shows us what God expects, what is, what he demands that we do, what he forbids us from doing, and we need to know what happens if we don't obey. We're going to get to that in chapter 6. We need the law. But we also need the gospel, which shows us that Jesus has, by his work, God has declared us not guilty. That's that word teaching about righteousness. Now, these people getting the milk, he's talking about the fact that they're getting the Old Testament law code stuff. Remember the Old Testament Jews, who now become believers, but they got stuck. And he's trying to push them forward to the solid. Because unless you move past the old covenant into the new, which is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and eternal life, that's the teaching of righteousness, you can't be saved. Now, he's not saying all of that right here, but it's behind what he's saying. And he gets to it in this letter pretty quickly here. Chapter 7. Okay, does that make sense to you all? So we have much to say about this. I put a couple of passages in here, milk versus solid food, because it does come up in two other places as an example. 1 Peter 2, 2-3, to like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He's using that picture in a different way than the writer to the Hebrews is. He's saying you need pure milk, so that you can grow up. What the writer to the Hebrews is saying, once you're growing up, you need the solid food to go even further. Okay? And the pure spiritual milk, milk that Peter's talking about is the Word of God. Okay? Paul talks about it to the Corinthians, too. He says to the Corinthians, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. Indeed, you still are not ready. Paul is using that picture the same way as the writer to the Hebrews is. 
One of the passages that led some scholars to believe Paul wrote Hebrews, like, like Martin Luther, I'm pretty sure Paul didn't write uh, Hebrews. We don't know for sure if you go back to the first lesson. Okay? Go ahead, Roger. I like 14 on uh, the HP. Verse 14. But some of the fruit is for mature people who have senses trained by practice to distinguish between good and evil. So it's not like just happens. Yeah, that's that word trained. The word trained. And they, they take it with the full picture of that word. Mm -hmm. Training is good for us, right? I mean, when I was... Uh, uh, a college student, we trained all the time because I played intercollegiate soccer. You cannot just train for a couple of weeks and play soccer. If you're going to be top quality, you have to train all year round. Okay? Because you have to keep your, your stamina and things like that. So we're training all season, all year long so that we can play in the fall where, where we, that's where men's soccer is. And, um, we did pretty good, I guess. We were 27, one and one my senior year. <laughs> Top ranked college in NAIA in Wisconsin that year. So I still am paying for that training, by the way. <laughs> my hips and my knees. I was I, I played as a striker or a wing. So I was a forward. I was getting hammered all the time by defenses. And back then the rules were a lot different than they are today. Today they protect players a lot more. Then you could get slide tackled from every every direction. Now, if you come from the back, it's always a, a yellow or a red card, depending on how hard you hit. So the rules have changed to make it safer. Probably a good thing. But yet over the season, you got all these cleat marks all over your back of your legs because you had you had <laughs> protection on shin guards, but the backside, oh my. Then you'd walk like this until Christmas time. <laughs> all right. You no longer try to understand. Did you catch that in there? Right in verse 11, you no longer try to understand. Oh, is that a big punch in the nose? Isn't it? So the writer's making a judgment. You guys are getting, not only are you getting stuck and not going forward, but you don't even try. It just says you become too lazy. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's where I'm going. And slow to learn. Yeah, but but that doesn't really say what the Greek is saying here. The Greek text is, is really, you're just not even trying. You're not trying. You know, when you when you look at, well, I'm in a lot of sports uh, illustrations today, but as a coach, and I had girls, girls varsity, and Girls are a pain to coach in high school because they're so social. It's not so much about themselves as it is about how do my teammates view me. And so sometimes you had a player that nice kid, but they're not trying because they'd rather be okay than make a mistake for trying. Of course, when I noticed that, I made them run suicides. So. <laughs> They learn quickly, you can't do that. But it, it, girls are hard to coach compared to boys at that age. Boys are just stupid at that age, you know? <laughs> Their juices are flowing kind of all over the place, you know? And, and uh, with boys, you just say, I want you to run through that wall. Yeah, coach, how fast? <laughs> you know, girls, oh, well, how will that affect my relationship with the rest of the girls on the team? And well, my boyfriend might be watching too, by the way. <laughs> And, oh, it's that time of month. I don't know how I survived eight years of that. <laughs> Actually, it was fun. They're good kids. I had a good time. They no longer tried to understand. What was the problem? It's hard to be a believer in Christ. That's not the easy route through life. You know? And when you see the persecution that was happening to these folks, better to back up than to get hammered, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that's good for right now. I'm going to do verses 1 and 2 uh, and 3 of Hebrews 6, unless you have questions. And the big section is the one after that, 4 to 8, is really a tough section of the Scripture. Therefore, 
There it is again. All right, I think I hammered that enough. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings. Let's move on past the milk into the solid food. Try. It's just try. It works. You never get anywhere if you don't try, right? Well, I can't read this. I remember my kids when they were little. I just can't read this. It's too hard for me. I don't care. Read it. <laughs> you know, try at least. I'll help you out. I guess I was a demanding coach at parent. Hey, Pastor. Yeah, well, <clears throat> some of you need it more than others. Yeah, yeah. Let us move on beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. So we don't want to go back all the time and say the same things over and over again. Yes, if you, if you do this sin, you go to hell. On the other hand, when I preach, I recognize that we have all different levels of maturity in a congregation. I still need to hear the simple truths, but I can't get stuck on them. I have to go past that. And when I preach, I hope I give you a range from the simple, the soul that sins dies, to believe in Jesus, you're forgiven. But there's all kinds of other stuff in there too, isn't there in a sermon? Okay, hopefully I haven't become simplistic. If it gets to that, you need to talk to me because then it's time to retire. That could sometimes happen with older pastors, you know? I heard one of those on Sunday. What's that? It's simplistic sermon. Not for me. I wasn't here Sunday, it was on yeah. the valley. I think I was on this campus Sunday, wasn't I? Yeah. I, I write down in my calendar now where I'm supposed to be every day. I forget. This week I'm here all the time. I'll be here tomorrow again, too. Okay. And let us not lay again the foundation of faith in God. You already know what it means to believe in Jesus. Instruction about cleansing rites. Oh, now he's talking about something else, isn't he? He's going back to Old Testament rituals that were connected with the promises of Christ because we're supposed to be pure before God. So all of these things were there. Kosher, eating, purification laws, and so on. The laying out of hands. What's he talking about, talking about there? Giving uh, faith to people? Laying no, I don't think so. I think he's talking there about installation, ordination. Guys laying on the hands, you know. Did the Jews do that in their Oh, customs? yeah, sure. And then they also used oil. So when you, right. had, when you had a high priest being installed, ordained, they laid the hands on. Yeah. I think that's what he's talking about here. The resurrection of the dead. And eternal judgment. So he's talking about, he's just pulling stuff out that, you know, we should all know this already. In, in our case today, we would probably say, you know, but we're not going to abandon this milk stuff, but we say it every week. It's called the... Absolution? No. Well, that's part of it that we know. Oh, it's called the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. We're repeating all these mm -hmm. basic tenets of the Christian faith. Somebody asked me, well, how come you do that and uh, all these other modern churches don't use the creeds anymore? And I said, yeah, I can't speak for them. I think it's stupid they don't because every week we have to re review and state the basic truths of the word. And, and, and I, I've always thought repetition was the mother of learning. I think that's true. You retain what you say again and again and again. So we always want to have that, but we don't get stuck there. I want to move forward, okay? But the Methodist Church recites the Apostles' Creed regularly. Mm -hmm. About every three weeks. There's, in That's fact, good. two weeks, we recite the Apostles' Creed. That's good. So if they drop the... the... No, the Nicene Creed, no. Yeah. That was a surprise to me when I came here. Oh, yeah. Um, I think Lutherans centuries ago decided that we would kind of use the Apostles' Creed on non-communion times and use the Nicene Creed for communion. You know, when they were written originally, uh, the Apostles' Creed was the individual statement of faith, I believe. 
And the Nicene Creed actually has in there, we believe, and that's the joint statement of faith. And when you put that with communion, which is one of the aspects of communion, communion means fellowship, participation, all of us who commune together are saying we believe this together. So that's why it's on the communion Sundays. It kind of fits that way. And I read no. that Andalusian Creed. The Athanasian? Creation, yes, I read that Sunday morning. Oh, yeah. It's on page 132. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool, eh? Yes. We'll be using it in about four weeks, three weeks. First Sunday in June, we'll be using it. That's No, that's Pentecost. Second Sunday in June. It'll be Trinity Sunday. I have you sit for that one. <laughs> it takes a while to read it. But uh, for worship services, you know, you're also looking at other aspects. Now, back in the day, they would be going to church for five hours. Luther's sermon sometimes lasted two. They stood Count yourself blessed. <laughs> <laughs> they stood through the service, too, I believe. They did, yeah, they had pews. Yeah. But most of them couldn't read, right? That's correct. So, I mean, that, the sermon, they, they were getting the word mostly through the sermon. So. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. But they had Bible classes, too. They just didn't look yeah. exactly like ours. But, yeah. What we're doing today is that what the, we're not doing anything new that the church hasn't been doing forever. You know, the whole New Testament church has been doing this. It's just whenever you see something where it changes, uh, Pastor Frazee was telling me on the phone the other day, that he's just about done with his STM sacred ministry um, master, which is the next thing up from the master div. And uh, his, his, he's almost done with his thesis, which is on baptism as something, this immersion kind of thing of baptism is something new to the church. And we know that it only started 500 years ago, not even. Yeah, before that, the church never did that. Anytime you have something new, I'm not talking about new style or anything like that, but you have a new way of doing things like the Lord's Supper, baptism, whatever. If it's new, it's probably not right. The church has been going on a long time. Okay, so just uh, that's what those verses are for. Okay, now, Roger, do you want to read verses 4 to 8? Sure. <clears throat> for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gifts, and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have then fell away to be restored to repentance because they are crucifying the Son of God again to their own harm and exposing him to public ridicule. For the land, he said, Ava, for the land that drinks the rain that often falls on it produces plants useful to those farming it. This land receives a blessing from God, but the land that grows thorns and thistles is worthless and will soon be cursed, and, it, and its end is to be burned. Impossible for those who once enlightened to have paid Just hang on a second, we're just double checking the different of scriptures here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read you just the last part of that Matthew 12, because this connects with it, okay? Um, I'm too far here. Okay. Got the wrong chapter again. Jesus says, He was not with me, this is starting in verse 30 of chapter 12 of Matthew is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in, the, either in this age or in the age to come. Do you wear out your ear? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. He's really, really struggling. He's really struggling with this call. Yes, yes, he is. So we'll see. Sure hope he takes it, though. I, I, I could really work with this guy. Yeah, I enjoy the he's, he's got a lot of great ideas for our church already. Usually you don't get that far if you're declining. So we'll see. Yeah. God's will. 
But we call this the sin against the Holy Spirit. You know, we know Jesus died for the sins of the world, so how in the world could he not forgive the sin against the Holy Spirit? I mean, if he forgave, if he was punished for every sin, why aren't people forgiven if they commit this sin? Because Jesus died for it. And that's the crux of this particular teaching, which is one of the hardest ones in the scripture to come to grips with, like the descendant of hell that we were talking about. This one's right up there with it. Um, this one here has more supporting passages. Now you see there, I, I say, sedes doctrinae. I'm just showing you how smart I am with Latin. But actually, that's the Latin. The sedes is the proof passage, the most important passage of any doctrine. We call it the sedes doctrina, uh, doctrina pa passage. So uh, that's what we have here uh, with these other passages. So there's five passages on the sin against the Holy Spirit. How, how does somebody come to faith? Through the word. I mean, not yeah. just the word. Faith really. comes from hearing the message, the message of the word to refer to the word of Christ. But not just through the message of the word of the, the gospel. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works faith through it. That's one of his right. tools, okay. right? So when you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're basically telling him, I don't want to listen to you. And so without the Holy Spirit working through the word, you can't believe. That's where this, that's the bottom line of this doctrine. So somebody who sins against the Holy Spirit is saying, even though I believe this once, get out of my life, Holy Spirit. I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, that's the basic teaching of this. Uh, to whom does this kind of teaching apply? To those who are talking about running away from the faith and telling the Holy Spirit in the process, I don't want you in my life. <coughs> now, we don't know who commits this sin. It's impossible because we can't see the heart. Okay, but we have one kind of interesting example in the Old Testament, and that has to do with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, every time a plague comes up, he hardens his own heart. But when you get to, I think, the sixth or seventh plague, the scripture says, the Lord hardened his heart. He never could become a believer ever again. God made his eternal judgment on that man before he died. From my sinful nature, that's supposed to really scare me. And it does. Because I have tasted that the Lord is good. I've tasted not only of the milk of his word, but also of the solid food. I have confessed Jesus my Savior. And to now say, I don't want anything to do with you. And Holy Spirit, don't work. It's unfathomable. But I know if I did that, this warning here comes out pretty strong. Right, so that means that some people become unredeemable. Mm-mm. -mm unsavable. Everybody has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, but they only get it by faith. Okay? But they're lost causes. Yeah, the problem is we don't know Perfectly who that is. lost causes. Right, but we don't know who it is, so we can't make the judgment, well, that person's a lost cause. We'll keep going with the gospel, uh, because people that just stop going to church aren't necessarily sinning against the Holy Spirit. No, no, but, but, but when you can listen to what they say. By their fruits you'll know them, yes. yes. But this is a heart issue here. And I can't see hearts. I can only listen to what they say, and I can only see what they do. But hypocrites are really good at looking like Christians, and they're not in their hearts. Yeah. But I don't know the difference, so I treat them like a Christian. God knows those who are his. Okay? Now, just going back to this passage again, and then we'll, we'll come back to you, Roger. Verse 5 is really important. Okay? So it's impossible with those who have once been enlightened. The word enlightened, the Holy Spirit enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the true faith. Luther's explanation of the third article. Who have tasted the heavenly gift. Notice how he's using that picture of taste on this section. Who have shared in the Holy Spirit. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. We know what's coming, okay? Who have, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. 
okay? But we have to know there's a difference between somebody that just becomes a backslider and one who has sinned against the Holy Spirit. There's, those are two different things. But the one thing is true. Only a person who once was a believer in reality can sin against the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers haven't sinned against the Holy Spirit, even if they've rejected the gospel because they haven't tasted that the Lord is good. You get my point? Now this is, like I said, this is a tough doctrine because we don't have the ability that God has to look inside a person and say, oh, that person is that unregenerate. Okay? Is, is the author uh, uh, aiming this part of the scripture uh, solely to, to Hebrews as opposed to Gentiles also? Or is it everybody? Everything written in the script, scripture has been written to teach us so that by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Peter wrote that. All the scriptures are here for all of us. But there was the initial group that this was addressed to. And so in this particular case, he's talking to these Hebrew Christians who tasted the Lord is good. The problem is they stayed on the milk. They didn't get further. And now they're being tempted to give it up and go back. He's warning them, don't do it because this is the real possibility. You can't be saved. Okay? That's the context of this chapter. Go ahead. The person I think of is Judas. You know, with Jesus... First, for money, he sells them out. And then, is it at the Lord's Supper that Jesus, that devil, entered into him? That's what it says. Right? And, uh, but then afterwards, he must have felt some remorse, I think, because he threw that money back at him. Oh, yeah, he knew what but he then did. then he went and killed himself, the ultimate sin. It's so, it's like changing doors there from. Yeah, he, he, uh, we're not told he sinned against the Holy Spirit. So no, I don't know if no. it's this sin. And that's, see what I mean by how tough this is? We don't have even many examples in the scriptures of this. Pharaoh's probably the best one. But it's certainly a pretty particular warning, isn't it? And I read that, those last verses of, uh, of Matthew chapter 12 there. I read verses 30 to 33, I think. And Mark and Luke and, are, are just the same thing. They're just repeating that same point, only not as many words. So, so did Judas know that there was no way he could return? That's why he went and no, killed himself? No, he, he despaired of his sin instead of going to his Savior for forgiveness like Peter did. Peter's sin of denial and betrayal of Judas are the same sin, basically, aren't they? If you think about it. And, and Peter, though, when Jesus confronted him, he repents. The beginning, pride took over. I won't do that, not me, I'm the tough guy here. And when he fell, Jesus looked at him, that look just crushed him, and he went out and wept bitterly. Those are tears of penitence. And Jesus then especially restores him at the Sea of Galilee later on after his resurrection, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, okay? Uh, Judas, though, he despaired of, of the forgiving love of God. And, and so in his despair, he took his own life, which is why so, for so many centuries, the church would not bury a suicide. Luther did. But the church generally did not do that because they did not understand uh, psychological disorders like we do today. Um, and so today, you have to be really careful with a suicide. Do I do a funeral of a suicide or, is, or not? And again, what you said before, Big is true. You have to go on what they're saying and doing. There are a lot of Christians that have psych psychiatric issues. Their brains aren't aligned right. And especially with bipolar people, if you suffer with bipolar ever, uh, I'm kind of borderline with that. I go like crazy and then I end up in a hole. So I have to really watch. Those of you who have known me a few years know that that's, one of the, that's why they, I get encouraged. It's time for you, Pastor, to take off a few days. I'm also a workaholic, you know, and a perfectionist. Those are all terrible things to be when you're bipolar. See? And the problem with bipolarism, we used to call it manic depressive uh, syndrome. But when you're in that depressive state, you come out of it. You never come out as high as you were before. And when you go low, you always go lower than you were before. And it gets to a point with some people that medication won't help. Um, 
lifestyle choices won't help, and they bottom out. And I, I have had members that they got to that point. They were fighting the fight, but the disease of the mind took over. These people were confessing Christ all the time, but you knew if God didn't take them home soon, um, they would find a way to kill themselves eventually. Not that they wanted to. So we have to be real careful on that judgment too nowadays, you know. Uh, but then on the other side, some people are just despairing that God can help them. Then it's unbelief. I can't always tell the difference. I, and by the way, I'll err on the side of, uh, um, uh, on, the, on the right side. I'm not going to err on the side of being judged uh, when it comes to that. So if you ever see that in our congregation, I do a funeral, and we all know it's a suicide, assume that I've gone through all of this and there's a reason. <laughs> You know, don't take the negative right away. You can ask me and I'll tell you whatever I can. So on a much more, I guess, positive note, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the thing that I find re so reassuring is that when you're talking to someone who isn't a Christian yet and they say, you know, I've done these horrible things, he's never going to forgive me. You can go back to these examples and say, yeah, you can be forgiven. You know, he's can, already, you, he's already forgiven you. Yeah. Jesus already died for those sins. Right. Yeah. And, and what a comfort uh, you know, to, to uh, be able to bring up examples. That's, that's part of the hard thing, though, is when you meet somebody who isn't a believer, how do you get them to see that they need forgiveness? That's the big question. You know, if that's guilt, if their guilt is overwhelming, then that's a yeah. great, that's a great time to jump on board. Well, that's exactly right. But um, the problem is that most people that aren't believers don't see their guilt. It's that person's fault. I'm in this situation, you know, especially in our era today. Well, until they're crushed by life. And that's what you pray God to do. Yeah. So they have to come crawling, and that's when what you're saying is true. Be of good cheer; your sins are forgiven. If you look at a lot of the miracles uh, stories in the Bible, a lot of times the people are crushed first by whatever's happening. In my personal devotion today, I read about the, the, the son of the guy who um, had an evil spirit who always throw himself in the fire and stuff like that. That's just about the only time people gain any insight. You usually learn it's from tough times. when they're almost destroyed. Yeah. Tragically. Yeah. Thank God he never leaves us to that. But despair is a terrible thing. But we, all I'm uh, saying today is we have to be careful that we don't let um, things we know about the misalignment of your brain when it comes to bipolar. It's just your brain chemicals are all out of alignment like a car. It's driving this way down the road. That there are some diseases that we understand today like we didn't know even 40, 50 years ago, how they really affect people. And Christians suffer from all these things too. If they're fighting the fight, that's different. I remember Professor Becker in a seminary class, I think it was in Romans class, but um, he was talking about when he was still in the pastoral ministry, you know, at a congregation, that he had a man that had this problem all the time. And... Uh, it was tied in with alcoholism, I think, if my memory's right. But he'd come in all the time for encouragement because he was always living with this fear of, of the kicking in again. And uh, Professor Becker always prayed that the Lord would spare him committing the sin of suicide. And he did. He got killed crossing the street in Chicago by a car. Didn't see him at night. Killed him. Now, it looks, sounds like a tragedy, but in his particular case, he was killed without having to commit that kind of sin. Only Christians can understand things like that. It seems horrific. Mm -hmm. and, and Professor Bagger wasn't praying that he got killed like that or anything. <clears throat> but Lord, you know, preserve this guy from committing a sin that could put him in hell forever. It's the prayer of every faithful pastor about every member. Lord, don't let them fall away and, and curse the Holy Spirit, you know. That's why we have elders working. That's why at Easter time, I sent a personal letter out to 12 different family units. Some were single people, but, you know, addresses. 
uh, encouraging them to get to worship again because I fear for their souls. I don't put it that short, but in a paragraph. And I put in, they were all in big envelopes like that, and I put our flyers for Easter in there. Not one of them showed up at church in Easter time. I grieve over that because they should be in the meat, and they're not, and their lives are being affected negatively by that, but they can't see it. But if you continue doing it, they might. That's why I keep doing it, yeah. And, and even if you had one, even if you had one out of years and years and years of that, that's enough. It's not enough, but... It's not enough, but, but there's the reward. Yeah, the reward comes on Judgment Day, because I'll never see most of the results of that ministry. But yeah, but that's why we do it. The joy so, comes. Uh, what's that? The joy comes. Well, the joy of being the fact that my sins are forgiven. But well, yeah. as a pastor, I'm supposed to shepherd. And what does Jesus say? You leave the 99 and go after the one lost, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why we have the Board of Elders. And, and that's what we practice. We just had a meeting yesterday uh, dealing with some of that. And uh, I suppose on one end, we should be very thankful that it's only 11. <laughs> You know, it comes out to like 15 or 16 communicants only out of 187 or whatever we have right now. That's a pretty small percentage, thank God. But we always have to be on our guard because anybody could flip into that again. That's going every week now. So that's why we keep encouraging. Get the Bible study. Get the worship. Because we need to get off of the milk so we're not trapped in our own weaknesses by Satan. Okay. A couple other things. Uh, Professor Pieper, uh, who has been dead probably 100 years now, in his, he was an LCMS professor. Uh, his brother was a Wells guy. Back in the day, there wasn't any difference, you know, just historically where we started. And uh, Professor Pieper has a four volume doctorate book that thankfully has been translated into English, but I don't know if you can even buy these anymore. They're pretty old books. But I, I quoted in here uh, his definition. The sin against the Holy Spirit is committed when, after the Holy Ghost has convinced a person in his heart of the divine truth, that person nevertheless not only rejects the truth he is convinced of, but also blasphemes it. That's the cursing, the God part there. Okay? He also said the sin is precisely, according to Scripture, the malicious revolt against the internally convincing operation of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the sin against the Holy Spirit isn't just falling away from faith or, or backsliding where you put other things as a priority. But people that do that are in danger of this, see? And so we want to call them the repentance. And the maliciousness. The malicious part is saying, you know, God damn you, Holy Spirit, you know, kind of thing. It also be saying, you're wasting your time in this Bible. What are you doing here? I, I went to that stuff, and guess what? I got nothing out of it. <laughs> Yeah. So, so let's go to the bar instead. Come on. The arrogance. That's malicious also, isn't it? Um, not quite like this, though. Because that's a, a direct attack against the Holy Spirit and His work, His operation. That's what makes it different than any other sin in the Bible. And if the Holy Spirit's not working through the gospel in your life, you cannot be saved. That's why, you know, that doesn't mean Christ didn't die for those sins. It means you don't get the benefit because of that. That sin against the Holy Spirit. There are people that have, have fallen away for a while, but they come back. That them sin against the Holy Spirit. They just got real lazy. And you hope that what was planted in there, that ember, can be fanned into flame. Okay? I think Isaiah talks that way about that. Okay? So, does the sin occur today? I believe so, all the time. Uh, but... We can't see who it is, just like we can't know uh, who a hypocrite is. I know in English, hypocrite is a word, well, you don't do what you say. None of us do what we say when it comes to faith. I'm going to be, I'm not going to sin against God. <laughs> we, we fight for that, don't we? But we always fall. That's not the, being a hypocrite, biblically speaking. Uh, hypocrite comes from, that's actually the Greek word for an actor. Right, that's the mask. Of the Greek actors, there's four of them. You put the mask on, it covers who you are for the sake of the character. 
Biblically speaking, a hypocrite looks like a Christian. That's the mask that they wear. They're real good at it. But underneath, there's no faith. Hypocrites really can't sin against the Holy Spirit because they've never, they're not really believers. But, but everybody isn't a hypocrite. Oh, no, no, no. Well, but, and everybody's not a hypocrite all the time. I mean, those, there are people who are not, and they, they suffer terribly for it. But biblically speaking, the person who's a hypocrite, Jesus defines this, are people that want to have everybody see, I'm the best Christian in the world. Yeah. And in their hearts, they're not believers. Again, we can't tell who they are because we can't see the heart. But the Lord knows. So I treat everybody that's in church Sunday as a fellow believer. But it's very possible that somebody here is not a believer, but they want it to look that way. But if I sat and tried to be the, you know, the, the gospel detective, um, that's not my, my position, not my call. That's a God position. That's where the judge not lest you be judged business comes in. But the discerning part, he just said here, you got to know good and evil. So we do have to judge things. Not all judging is sinful. Okay? Finally, verses 9 to uh, 12. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. So he just hammers them and warns them about what happens if you, you, know, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Now he comes back and he says, but I know that we are convinced of better things in your case. Yeah, you have a fight and you have a temptation that you're thinking about doing, but I, I know things are going to work out better than this, okay? The things that have to do with salvation, you're not going to reject the Spirit. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So he's acknowledging the fruits of their faith, right? We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. Whether you are executed for Christ or just die at God's appropriate time. Right? To the end. So that, when you see so that, that's called a purpose clause. Sometimes in modern Greek scholars will call it a final clause. So that what you hope for may be fully realized. What do you hope for? Salvation. I hope for the resurrection of the dead. I'm saved now. That's my hope. And I'll see that, resurrect, that realization when Jesus returns on the last day. Right? That's what he's talking about. Fully realized. Not just partially. See, it's partially realized every Sunday your sins are forgiven. In the Lord's Supper, your sins are forgiven personally. In the gospel that's proclaimed, whether it's in the sermon or in the readings, that's partially realized. Fully realized is when we don't have to fight anymore. We're with the Lord forever. Can't wait, huh? Verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy. He's just come full circle, hasn't he, from where we started? With this, uh, is that where we started earlier today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I earlier said you, you, you don't try to understand. And I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. So now he comes back to that after he beats up on their sinful natures. He comes back and says, but I know there's going to be a better end for you. Okay. And so he's being a faithful pastor of these people. That's what he's doing. You, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what is promised. The example of Christians is huge. It starts in the family, with Christian families. That's why it's such a terrible time today, because the breakdown of the family is in its fifth and sixth generation now, since World War II. World War II did a lot of damage to family, in my opinion. You can have your own opinion, but the guys were gone a long time. Women found out that they didn't need the men, which men should have always known. <laughs> <laughs> don't need us. Um, they're pretty strong, they're pretty smart, and they're resilient for the most part, especially those who have uh, been blessed with having children. They, they kind of know <laughs> they have to bounce back. You know, all the time. Uh, but it's true for all women, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, these guys that grew up through depression times, and now they fought the war, and their buddies were killed there, hundreds of thousands of them. And, and uh, 
they come back to the states and it's a whole different reality now. Um, we could be dead at 21. They saw death all the time. And now you have this desire to, well, eat, drink, and be merry, almost that, that kind of thinking, for tomorrow we die. Now they didn't all have it, but enough of them did. So back in the 1950s, we started noticing, well, I didn't because I was born in the 50s, but um, society started noticing that getting money so that my kids don't have to go through a depression or a war like that. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden the term latchkey kids comes up in the discussion. Then we get to the 60s with all of the radicalism because the pendulum never stays in the middle, it doesn't seem. So after the war, everybody's hyped up. You know, we won the war. We're going to make it, you know, and we're going to make sure kids don't have trouble. And that pendulum went this far because the parents were neglecting their kids. Now we have the, the hippie movement and all stuff like that. Then you throw drugs into the mix. Then you throw in divorce starting to pile up because I never knew anybody who was divorced until I was in, in my 20s. Personally, I never met anybody. I heard about it and there were times it was necessary, but now it becomes no fault. Okay, that's 50 years ago. And now it's just degenerated. In the families where you get the best examples about how to be people, how to be men, how to be women, and in a Christian family, what's expected of Christians. And if your parents are doing it, you're going to do it too for the most part, unless society gets you racked up. And that happens all too often. That's what I was talking to the kids about yesterday. You left out 50 years of aborting babies. Not part of the same discussion, but it is part of the problem, okay? Because it's a descending disintegration of God's blessing of life, you know? Sin. Yeah. Yeah, Sin. yeah but, but I want to get to the main point I was trying to make here, and that's that in the church, we have to be spiritual fathers and mothers to all, all the people there, not just to our own personal families. And I'm keenly aware as a pastor that you see my kids and my grandkids here, and hopefully... You've seen that passed down. Something else passed down by my grandparents and my parents to me. I think that's all part of this whole discussion, isn't it? To not get lazy with the faith. It's okay to have struggles, both spiritual and physical and financial and medical and as God uses that to, to toughen us up for the next fight. But it's not all right not to have the example of the word become lazy with faith. It, it takes a lot of work just to pray daily, morning and evening. I, I think for people to, it's easy to go to bed without it. It's easy to wake up and start doing your thing. With, I mean, you really have to have a pattern that, that you train yourself in to do that. Or It's a spiritual habit. One of these years, I'm going to start up with a, a thing I've done over and over in my ministry four decades worth now. And I have a thing about spiritual habits. There are good things, and that'll get tied in with, as Mark Metz in particular gets working with uh, spiritual gifts and stewardship. Uh, look in your boxes this week, and I'll make sure you get one too. But um, there'll be that four-page survey coming out for everybody. How can I serve? The reason we do that is we're one big family in Christ and, and uh, the family of believers and it shows up in a congregation and we work together to proclaim the gospel from us and among us. And there's strength in numbers, you know. Spiritual habits, prayer, Bible study, personal stuff. That's why we hand out things like the meditations, which we got to put out for Sunday. The new ones start up here in a couple of weeks, right? So that's why the forward in Christ is important. There's all kinds of neat stuff in there about the examples of faith. So, all right. See, if I'd start on time, we'd be done on time. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time. And also thank you for the warning that the Holy Spirit 
made sure was in the scripture so that we don't become lazy with our faith or with your word. Strengthen us always by giving us that pure spiritual milk, as Peter talks about it, the gospel. But then also help us to grow by ingesting the, 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 the meat, the, the, the solid food of the, of the scriptures. Also that we can continue to battle and in the end be with you to see the realization of our hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. So there'll be class next week. Yeah. Let's just close. All right. Do we go on into chapter seven? We will be doing the rest of